Ever wondered how you could use wood grain to improve the beauty of your projects? If so, stick around. All right, let's get into it. The beauty of wood grain and the use of it in a graphic way, how to use it more effectively to make our projects even more beautiful, to magnify the natural beauty of the wood. Now, when we think of wood grain, we're actually thinking of it in two ways. We're thinking of wood grain uh, as the growth rings. So if we look at this piece of cherry, you can see, let me turn it this way, you can see the growth rings, that arch, can you see that all right? Yeah. All right, so you're seeing the arch. This is where the grain of the tree is in plane with the surface. This side, you can see it even stronger. This is called cathedral figure. That's where the grain is flat to the surface or flat sawn, plain sawn. And then as you get over here, it's starting to angle down the growth rings so you get more of a linear combed kind of grain here. Now, a lot of times we're thinking of grain like that, like saying, oh, that has nice grain, when we're actually talking about the growth rings and the pattern they show on the face of the board. But I wanted to look at grain at another way, the granular level, the fibers, what's going on really down close. And so I took this magnifier, I took a shot of the side, the side grain, and then the end grain. Now I wanna show you the photos of this very board. So that is a zoomed in uh, look at cherry, the side grain. So we're seeing these are the fibers. Look at all those little fibers. They're all like knit together. They're like straws, but they're not as clean and straight as straws. They're all these fibers that are just bundled together and the moisture from the tree is wicked or by capillary action is taken up to, to the tree, to feed the tree, to grow the tree. You can see these darker striations. That's sort of like the uh, pitch in cherry. Um, also can be known as lignum that's holding those fibers together. But it's all the side grains. So all those tubes, all those fibers are running across this way along the length of the tree. Let's look at the next shot. The very same piece of wood looking at the end grain. So this is the exact same wood, but looking at the end grain, you have, now you're looking at all the ends of the fibers. So you're seeing all these little holes, like cherry is considered a close grain, closed grain wood, but you can actually see there are a lot of holes here, but see how most of them are, they are clogged up as well. So you can't really, water can't pass through there easily. These little striations here, they're not the growth rings, those are the actually medullary rays which run perpendicular to the growth rings. This wide little swath right here is, is the early growth. So you have more porosity here. And then as you get lower here, this is later growth. And then you'd get into another ring. But that's the end grain. So you're looking at the ends of the fibers. Now, why am I talking about that? Why is it important? Because the fibers dictate how light reflects off them. So whether light bounces or whether light is absorbed. So light bounces a lot more easily off of side grain. So we have, we'd have bouncing light off this side grain and on the end grain, you have more absorption of light. So let's look at this in another way at this sample of cherry boards right here. Check this out. We've got two boards that were joined together and I re-sawed them. So this little arrow shows how the position was. And look at, you can see the growth rings, but the growth rings in this case also mirror, if you, you can't see it, but I can see it, it's zoomed in. The granular level, the grain of the wood is sloping on this as well, okay? So let's just see what happens if we were to match these up. If we were to slip match these, we would keep the angle of that grain going the same way. And that should be conducive to a good joint, but it's not in this case because 
we have this kind of linear angle grain here and then this flat sawn coming in this way. So it's really a horrible match right there. But what if we book match? So with book match, we open it like the leaf of a book and now we have the grain running counter to each other. So because I book match, I flipped the orientation of this. So this one's still rising, but this one is rising the other way. So if we glued this up like this, it might look like a good growth ring joint, but look at what happens to the way it reflects light. Are you seeing one yeah, side darker? The, Which side is darker? The right side. The right side, yeah. So the grain is running up and it's kind of running out the surface here. So more light is being absorbed into the fibers it's here. It's turned when you moved a little bit. <laughs> okay, over here it's running the other way, so it's bouncing, but watch this. We're gonna just rotate these. I know it looks like a magic trick, but it's... And we have the opposite. Now the one on the right is darker. I mean, the one that was on the left. Yeah. And it's simply because of the rising grain. So these two boards, you might ask, so how would you glue these up? This is really a tough one. I think I would get a new board. <laughs> these are, there's really no good way. You, it'd be hard to glue these up so that the growth rings would look nice. And definitely the grain is going to reflect light differently. I don't know if you've ever done this, but this has happened to me with cherry. You could glue up the entire dining table top out of the same tree, all boards from the same tree. And then you think you're gonna have a great looking finish, but just because of rising grain opposing each other, you will get like a reflective light and it will look darker on one side or the other. That's what's going on there. So I'm always trying to ha make sure the grain is running parallel with the surface in order to do like a book match or a come around match because you change the orientation to the surface. All right, so that's, that's grain in a nutshell here. This whole idea of light and darkness reflecting on the surface of end grain and side grain, we've seen it before. In fact, you've seen it a lot on some of the most spectacularly beautiful woods, just naturally stunning woods. And one of those is curly maple. Can you see the curl on this one? We will. I don't know how good it shows up on the camera. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So it's got curls. Now, what is that? It's actually the fibers are rolling. So you're seeing some into the end grain, which looks darker, and then behind the grain, which looks lighter and reflects light. Now, in these presentations, I was taking a cut off of these, sort of like this. I, was, I would just bandsaw across, and then I would take this piece up vertically and drive a chisel down and split it to see what happened to the fibers. And let's just look, this is a piece I did that with, I'm not gonna bother right now, but after splitting it apart, can you see the waviness there? I sure can. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. that, that's the actual orientation of the fibers. They are physically rolling like a roller coaster and that's why they reflect light the way they do on the surface. Now there's another wood that I love and if you've been following for a while, you know that I made my kitchen countertop out of this. This is flame birch and that's got incredibly great chatoyance. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Could you define chatoyance for us one more time? All right, so we're cat's gonna, eye. cat's eye, sha toy eye. <laughs> So again, I would make a bandsaw cut and then split it using a chisel and we'd get something, look at that. Is that insane or what? So a really pronounced roll in that grain. That's what's going on here. So this is flat, but it's just reflecting light differently by the way those fibers are oriented to the surface. Let's look at a, another one. I'm not gonna split this, but just to show you as an example, this is quilted, uh, big leaf quilted maple and from the West Coast. And it has crazy like patchwork. If we split this, we'd get another crazy wild figure, but I'm not gonna bother with this one, but that would be fun. You should, you should try that. It makes, it makes for great party 
uh, presentations when next time your friends are over. Uh, so you can try that. That This is an actual example. This is a piece of the um, quilted maple from a drawer, an extra drawer we had from our modern writing desk project. And it's a small pencil drawer. I have some finish on it. It's not even the best, but I want you to see with finish how the chatoyance or light plays off of the wild kind of changing grain. Can you see this? Is it changing? It's not as great if we put the light on it. Let me move. Okay. Oh, camera lady's moving. <laughs> Did that work? It does work better, I think, than the light. How about if I just go like that? Yeah, that's good. Okay, there we go. All right, let's stay right there. Stay right there. Okay. We've got another one. Um, we've got, this is ribbon mahogany. Let me just move that. How's it's that working? On my light here. Is that working? That aside, good. It's better. Thanks. <laughs> really good. How about this one? Yep. Okay. <laughs> It's tricky. You, you really? It doesn't work? How about this? That's better, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. So let's go back to this just for kicks. Huh? Not as great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you get you get the idea. Yeah. You're getting this reflective chatoyance um, off the material. Now, one thing I did that I really love, and I'm going to explore this idea more when I get back to the shop, is creating a wild uh, live edge in highly figured material like the flame birch. So here's another piece of flame birch. Look at this. We've got the, the arrow on the end, right? Look at, we've got the arrow on the end. So these two were in position. I resawed them and then I planed them down to a half inch. And we've got, so we've got two boards that are very similar. Now I got to thinking, what if we split it sort of like the way we did here? So if I split it down there, I was curious what would happen. And I drove a chisel down into it and it actually ran out kind of fast. And it ran out just like this. Look at that. So this is how the piece below ran out. And when it did, it actually followed the waviness of the grain. So there was no more like end grain there. This is all side grain. It's riven wood. It's like split. So it's going right along the fibers, the natural way that they roll. Now, why is that interesting? Because what I did was I then went to the board and I filed, sanded, and then put my super fast um, shellac finish on there. Mineral oil shellac. Uh, we have a video on that. We'll link to that uh, if you want to see that. That's when you're in a jam to get a Christmas project done fast. And this is what it looks like. Huh? Check that out. And now that, that is what resulted when I just drove that chisel in and ripped that piece off. So I just filed and sanded just by hand. I got in there and sanded those. Didn't take too long actually cleaned it up and then slightly uh, rounded that edge. And look at that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. What's cool about it is here we've got a straight cut. So this is cutting right over the waves. Here we've split the wood. So the waves are actually part. That's the way the grain is going. So I got some ideas from this, um, which I've shared with the various groups. And one of them is that if you put these back together, this is the orientation. If I drove a chisel in both of them about the same place, I would probably get a similar, I just drew this on there just to show, it would be similar, not exactly like, but you would be able to book match these and you can imagine these as doors, like small doors, where you would have the ultimate original, I mean, just feel that like, finger pull. You'd need no hardware on these doors. You just reach inside that live kind of edge and it'll be an incredible experience actually. <laughs> I think you'll have to try it to have actually to see it. what it's like. But there you could have a great looking door. Now you could also use this as a tabletop. Imagine if you drove and, and got whatever natural edge came out of some highly figured wood like this flame birch 
sanded it, and this became your tabletop. So with a project like that, you probably should start with your top and then build your base under it and saw whatever ripples you want into the apron. You can have a good time with this. Now, that's what's cool is that we're so used to seeing this kind of shape or wild beauty on the bark. So think about all the live edge tabletops we've seen. It's really can be so beautiful, but usually it's the sap of the bark and it can be quite nice. But here, what we're doing is we're, we're creating or forcing our own live edge with beautiful rippled material. So by splitting it and then making this the edge, you have so much potential to take beautiful woods and use the incredible grain to a maximum impact for visual and originality and just pure. I mean, it's, is there a more beautiful form of art, right? This is for the finger of Natural God, right? Center. And this is just like the tiniest thing. So, I mean, just think of what you could do with that. Tom, where do you get your birch? <clears throat> I get my birch, thanks for the plug, from our friendly, <laughs> our friends at Goose Bay Lumber in Chichester, New Hampshire, which, by the way, they told me recently they're setting up to ship. So I'll give you more information about that as we go along. Um, remember, if you enjoy this content, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing, and you'll get all this notice of when things come out. Another question before yeah. we go on. Andy's curious if the curl makes the wood stronger. The curl? Well, Andy, <laughs> I don't know about stronger, but it sure makes it hard to split. So <laughs> it probably does in a way because it's, it's knit. Like just to drive the chisel to split that took me a lot, a lot of force because this is a thick piece. But yeah, you wouldn't want to use this for firewood. Um, think of like ash, how straight it splits. It's just got very straight grain. But um, I wouldn't even worry about strength in a case like this. This is flame birch. This is a hard, beautiful, strong wood. So you can do a lot with that. Um, any other questions? Not this point. Okay. Now, just a few other things. We're used to seeing the amazing beauty of wood in veneers, like this crotch mahogany. Again, this is where the tree knit together, where you have limbs separate. So the, the fibers are all kind of knit together and you get this wild kind of rooster tail feathering of grain coming together. Here's another version of bur barn, um, barley burl. <laughs> this is burl wood. And this is really intense and beautiful. But this is all from Certainly Wood. If you're interested, you can check out um, all of the veneers that places like this have. If you want to use veneers for your decorative we'll have uh, links in there surfaces. After. But what I'm enjoying about this presentation is not so much veneers, but talking about solid woods and how we can deal with them. After saying that, I'm going to show you one more veneer. <laughs> I love actually using this. This is Cuban mahogany. You can cut these wedges of the ribbon cut or the quarter sawn section to create uh, like a striped radiant pattern. If you tape them all together, I've shown this on a few projects. If you built the uh, bow front end table, we did something like this on the drawer front, but you'll get a radiant kind of, it's like a fan, right? But beautiful, using the grain to describe and create this brilliance, radiance. So I'll show you a couple of photos right at the end of that. Now, we've talked for the, so far about that whole idea of side grain and end grain and reflectivity and how it creates the beauty and figure of wood. Now I wanna go back to the idea of the annual rings creating the appearance on the surface of the, of the wood. So here I have a piece of cypress Again, from our good friends at Goose Bay. <laughs> they love a good plug, and, and I don't mind. Uh, they're great. Anyway, uh, I, this is very straight grained. Now, I'm showing you this because what if you were to cut a curve in it like that? Okay? We're going to cut a curve. So I just took a template like that. So let's say this was going to be the an apron of a table, and you were going to cut a curve in there. Now, the grain is very straight, 
But when you cut curves, it you're going to be exposing a whole other kind of geometry of the face of this board. No longer are you in this flat straight plane, but you'll be cutting this arch, which is going to expose different growth rings. So you can predict sometimes quite accurately how those growth rings are going to move. And that's important because a lot of times when say this was a table rail, you would already cut the tenons, on the ends and have them notch. All of the joinery would be done while it's square. Then you would cut your curves. So let's just take a look at this and see if we can predict. Right in the center, the arch is almost to the front. So let's just say that it is right on the front. So let's pick a line, like this line here. This growth ring line. See how it's angling in this case? It's sloping, like rifts on. It's 45 degrees. So now let's go back to our curve. From the front, we're right at that location, but as we cut into the curve, we're gonna be going deeper and deeper or further away from that surface. So we'll, if we just trace one of these rings, like that ring, as we go further away from the surface while sawing the curve, the lines are going this way or upward, if this is our top. And then the same would be true on the other side. As we saw toward the end, again, the lines are going to be moving upward. So instead of having straight grain, we can predict as you see these pen lines here that it's going to be circling. Now it won't be that dramatic, but it will be like that. After you saw it out, look at that. Now we have this really interesting sweeping curve, which can be a decorative element using the grain to make a nicer looking piece of furniture. Now, that's one way with that angle grain. Another way is what if we had flat sawn? So this piece actually goes this way. There it is, okay? So this piece was flat sawn, or you see the growth rings are in plane, and there's that cathedral figure. And here we have, again, we have, we're gonna be sawing a curve into it. What kind of shape do you think is going to yield here? Well, let's just take a look. <laughs> look at that. Amazing. We've got this topographical rings. It's almost like a uh, contour map of mountains, you know? So you've got these rings. Now, sometimes if you can't remember your geometry class and cutting through <laughs> spheres and all that, you might have to do a practice run and just saw a piece of strap to see what it's gonna look like. But that's a great way to work with material. Another way, and I'm not going to saw this out, obviously, I don't have a bandsaw with me right at the moment. But, <laughs> but when you're dealing with cabrio legs, or in this case, a gentle curving French leg. Okay, so we've got this little French leg. Again, this is cypress, so it has a nice linear quality. This technique I'm showing you is especially important with linear quality. Now, you see how I've already traced the, the profile? In order to do a three-dimensional leg like this, you have to trace the profile on both legs, okay? You can do it from the front or you can do it from the back just flipping. So we did it here from the front. Now, I already made the choice of how this was gonna be because what I wanted to try to do here was orient these legs to the end grain, which is running, this case, is diagonal to the point, right? So it's, it's, all diagonal like this. It's running out corner to corner here and it's running across these corners. So how would I orient this pattern so that when I saw this curve on the face that these lines would follow the curve of the leg, right? Because right now they're straight. Wouldn't it be cool if we could think ahead and lay out our pattern so that when this curve is sawn, the growth ring lines actually gently follow the sweeping curve of that leg. So that's what we did here. I, I've already thought it through the same way we did this leg. And if you could, you could think it through too, like this was the high side, you could pick a line. And as you saw deeper in, you're going away from the surface so the lines are rising again, or they're moving 
this way. So that means on this face, after you saw on this side, these lines are going to be running over and following the curve, okay? They'd be rising away from the surface. So just, that means if you come down and you saw it this way, they're gonna be flowing this way as well. But all that's to say, here's one that was in the same condition, see, exact same, diagonal to the, the knee, and I sawed it out and check this out. Look at the, how those growth rings, these were dead straight with the face, just like this one. And now they follow that gentle curve. Look at it from this side. Again, here's another one. Same thing. Look at, can you see it on the camera? Yep. So you can see how those curve nicely there and then with this side. Now here's one. See, I've, if you do it with the lines coming out to the point of the knee, you will get this flowing curve that conforms with the gentle curve of your leg. Now, here's one where I did it the opposite way, where the growth rings are running across the point or the knee, and look what happens. You end up with this little circle here, but look how the growth rings actually fight the sweep. So we have this nice sweeping sawing cut, but the growth rings are going the opposite way. So they're fighting. It's almost like noise or there's a little visual conflict there. Now, does it bother you? Do you stay up at night like worrying about this visual conflict? Probably not. But when you look at that piece of furniture, something strikes you as being dissonant. It's not as pleasing as when you plan ahead and saw it out this way. Again, you'd have to plan ahead because you're gonna cut all your joinery while the leg is still square, and then you'll saw it out. But just lastly, imagine if you were, took these legs, which have those nice, sweet flow of curvature, and you took your sweeping apron and it ended up getting glued up something like this, wouldn't that be interesting? You'd have the, the bow front apron there would have a nice swag to it following the curve, and then you'd have it bracketed by these beautiful flowing linear grain. So that's another way to control grain. That, in that case, we're talking about the growth rings. All right, let's move on quickly to one more thing, and I'm gonna show you a few photos, and you can mull this over like I do. I can never get tired of it. All right, so what if we just took some veneer or some wood grain like this? This is white oak, it's riffs on. What if I just took a piece I would be cutting this, obviously. What if I cut it into like two inch squares and then joined it at right angles? Look at how just straight grain like this reflects differently. Can you see how, is one looking darker than the other? Yeah. Which one? Oh, the right looks darker right now. Right, so we're looking at the vertical grain. Usually when you're seeing grain vertically, it's going to reflect light differently than horizontal is gonna bounce on those fibers again. So it's the same side fibers, but just the orientation to the light creates a reflective brightness to one and not the other. So if I was to tape together, let's say four of them, and then I had this, you can see how, is it changing a little? Yeah. Okay, so you've seen that's just reflective light play. Again, on straight grain, now this time I glued up nine of them. So you can see how those play with the light. And that's an interesting thing to do on pieces all by itself. But what if we take it just one step further and we added depth and texture to this grain? So you cut rather than veneer, but you cut pieces that are a little thicker and rather than leaving them flat, you slightly dome them, which I did on this using sand, a belt sander keeping my fingers away from, of course. And then after it was belt sanded, using a wire brush, now I could use this by hand, and it would take me quite a while. But what I do is I take a six inch wire wheel and put it in the grinder and hand hold it and you can rapidly take away the softer growth rings of certain species, leaving the harder ribbed fibers of the later growth. Think about like southern um, pine, yellow pine. It has that really distinctive hardness and softness. Now that's not a great primary wood, 
but so I'm using, in this case, I'm using chestnut, which it's hard to find, but it is a, available a lot in reclaimed beams from barns and all that. Um, or wenge, a little more expensive material, but you can, you can find this. And if you treat it with a wire brush, it takes away those lighter brown, that's the early growth, leaving the darker line hard growth. And you end up with this gorgeous texture. You see that? Mm, Isn't that sweet? It gives you that warm texture to your fingers and wonderful wood. And then again here on this little piece I rounded over. These, these pieces have gone some miles with us on this trip, just sharing them with people, having fun. And I, here's the culmination of the patchwork. So rather than the dead flat, just getting the reflective result, we now have a three-dimensional using the woven checkerboard kind of technique and then burnishing it with the wire brush to create texture on that kind of quarter song grain. Here's a smaller piece we've shown and we'll link to different aspects of this. All right, so let's just get into some photos. This is a photo of a panel by Tim Coleman from a piece of furniture he made where you have um, it's bird's eye maple actually that he re-saw on this tiny little bird's eyes here. And he's got the grain of the upper and lower piece running vertically. This centerpiece, same material, is running at a diagonal. So it ends up reflecting light differently. So he beautifully joined these together. That's a secret for another day. To make this piece, this is, he called it arabesque. It has beautiful kind of uh, influence from shapes from the Arab world, the Arabian kind of sabers here, and then you have all this decorative. But what I really want to look at is the way that those ribbons, it appears to be these shimmering ribbons. When you walk past this, they're reflecting light differently and almost dancing on the surface of the rest of it that's very linear grain. And now I think you can see the bird's eye a little better there. But really beautiful piece, um, just decorated, decorated or painted by using that kind of orientation of the wood grain. Here's another version, an, another one by Brian Reed. This is a close-in of a detail of a screen, uh, a divider screen, where he's got the patchwork squares, a lot like I did with my little square piece, but in this case, he softened and rounded these here to relate and reflect with that soft rounded square here. So he's got them juxtaposed at 90 degrees to each other and you get this, this kind of gentle little reflectivity that relates so beautifully and the entire piece, not so great with the light here, but you can see that kind of checkerboard, but they're softer, rounder to relate to these piercings. Such a beautiful piece, love it. Now here's our writing desk, our modern writing desk project. If you wanna make this, you actually can, we've got drawings for it. But I wanna show you this because we've got these walnut legs and the people like good friends at Goose Bay. <laughs> Sounds like we're doing a promotion for them. They're really not sponsors, but they help us out a lot with great wood. So we've got, um, we've got this highly figured material on top and that's the quilted maple. So that I was showing you earlier uh, that we try, that uh, I showed you the drawer front. Now look at this, look at the chatoyance you get as I moved over the top. You can see it reflecting deeply, just like the cat's eye. That's something it's else. Funny. It's very disturbing and hard to get any work done on a desk like that. <laughs> but here, this is a, a photo of a bow front chest this is my dentist, which was our family dentist. We worked trades for family dental work for years. And uh, this was the last piece I made him to settle our debt. And the, I have no more of my original teeth. Uh, <laughs> I think he made up, that's why he's smiling so happily. He, he, did, he did great. <laughs> but I'm showing you this because the feet are like French feet and they flare out. So they swept out, you can barely see it down there. But the next photo I'm showing you is this foot in the, my vise. This is my old bench with the vise, we're looking down on it. And this is that French foot. So notice how it's got this nice swept curve in it. 
outswept curve, a good strong support for that chest. But notice how the grain is flowing so beautifully with the curvature of that sweat, of that sweeping curve. Now that was dead straight, just like that, that other uh, cypress I showed you. So I had to think ahead before I cut all the joinery, how this leg was gonna orient in space and then saw it. So I would have had the grain running out toward that corner, just like I showed you. So when you saw in, you get that outswept um, curve leg. So there you go, we've got that beautiful curve. Now here's using wood grain in a dramatic kind of splashy, almost paint-like. And this is an example of that ribbon mahogany I was showing you earlier. It gives you that gorgeous sunburst effect, drawer side doors, and we've got complimentary little ebony details there as well. This is just applied over a very kind of traditional federal form, but no other bells and whistles other than just using wood grain in a dramatic layout effect. No splashy bell flowers and contrasting colors. Here's a, a, a chair that was a wing, uh, kind of inspired by the wingback chairs, but this is the back of an easy chair um, that I made in Wenge and Macassar Ebony. And then this little diamond here is actually Amboynia Burl. So look at that interplay of wood grain, the figures, the paint, using the linear grain of the Macassar Ebony to kind of almost look like, um, I don't know, it's almost like the angles of bridge of supports, you know, like sweeping out. But it gives you the illusion of movement like it's ready to spring off the floor. But I, what I really want you to see is the texture on that leg. Let's get a little closer. Here's the front view. So here's the arm rolling out. This is all solid wingay, which I gave that wire brush textured effect. So you have this nice velour arm. You'd rest your arm on that and your fingers would curl over that front and feel that beautiful texture on there. It would give you this sense of warmth and age just just a great kind of tactile experience sitting in this chair. Now, the last piece I want to show you is the barn beam bed. And we have videos of this. We're going to connect a link to all of these videos that I've been mentioning here. They're all free. You can go to them and check them out more deeply if you're interested. This is like a modern sleigh bed. It's got this outswept headboard and this back swept footboard. And it's just veneered over with that patchwork application. These are all about six inch squares or diamonds. No two are the exact same. So they were all numbered and configured. And then they were wire brushed. Here's the headboard. And if we zoom in, you can kind of see the texture. It was all so nice and smooth. And when you wire brush, one beautiful thing is you don't have to sand. So it's like it's burnished and already sanded. So this had a great warmth quality to it, yet it was this formal kind of modernized bed. Simply using the gorgeous natural texture and figure of this chestnut wood grain. All right, hey, if you enjoy this content, check out uh, epicwoodworking.com and of course like, share, and subscribe, and tell your friends. Tell we, you. we love, it's, it's really, been a joy to see so many people on this trip. So thank you for coming out to all those events if you're one of them. And we're looking forward to one more uh, visit with the Michigan Woodworkers Group. Yes. And we'll be there soon, soon enough. Yes, sounds great. All right. So hey, <laughs> on behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> I'm holding it back. I really want to I yell. Know. She doesn't want it more. Good night, everybody. <laughs> night, everybody. Thanks See ya. so much. Take care.